Should I see if they could be a little quiet out there so it doesn't... Uh... Yeah, I will do that because you are already... Can you move the game a little? Because we are going to move the game. Oh, sorry. Just a few yards down the hallway. Thank you. Have been my big moment where I take the ball from the kids, <laughs> just, just saying nothing, just taking yeah, the ball, just take it and then come back here and <laughs> slam the door. <laughs> What's up? I'm Alex Bent. I play drums in Trivium. Um, I just blew up my practice amp, so that's pretty fun. <laughs> What I didn't know the last time we met in Ludwigsburg, that it was pretty much your sixth anniversary of being in Trivium, right? I didn't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's been a while, you know, time flies when you're having fun. Talking about having fun. First of all, I, have, I found it so funny that I didn't recognize you uh, the first moment, but you did sort of recognize me. That never yeah. happened before. Like, yeah. that's, that's a new thing. So thanks for that. It yeah, felt good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I, I love your channel. So, you know, when I saw you setting up and I saw your face, I was like, Hey, I recognize him. Yeah, so uh, good that that happened. Yeah. Um, since you know my program, it usually starts with why you're drumming and the law for drumming and what you like most about other drummers, but mm -hmm. I want to ask it straighter in a way. Yeah. So why drums? Why rock and metal? And what is it that let you choose this path instead of piano or jazz drums or orchestral percussion? Why drums and why metal drums? I think I was always just attracted to the energy of it. Even before I knew how to play drums, I would listen to the drumming and listen to the music, and there was just always something about that aggression, you know? And then once I started kind of understanding what they were doing, it started off, for me, I got into like pop punk stuff. I was into Blink-182 and Yellow Card, like, you know, drummers like Travis Barker, they were doing awesome stuff, but at that point I was at least able to start to understand what they were doing. And what happened is I started going down the rabbit hole of like, okay, I'm, I'm starting to understand this. Let's see what else is out there. And I just kept on following, okay, what's faster and faster? Yeah, I, I went from the pop punk stuff to kind of the more new metal stuff. You know, I got into like Korn and Slipknot. And by the time I was in high school, I was like totally into like the extreme death metal and black metal. And um, yeah, I just kept on, kept on going down that rabbit hole, man. There is one or two drummers when you finally click, when you really listen just, not just to the drums, but mainly to the drums. Mm -hmm. Like, man, this is so cool. Yeah, for me, it was Fear Factory when it really clicked. Yeah, yeah. There was metal way before that, but mm -hmm. it was Fear Factory when I realized, man, this is so inhumanly played. I need that. I need yeah, that in my life. That was another band for me as well. Like, I would hear Fear Factory and just be like, wow, this is amazing. And I want to know how to do this and not... And even if I don't end up knowing how to do it, I want to understand it more, you know? So yeah, I was just always attracted to that, you know? I was always attracted to things that I couldn't understand at first and I would just make it my goal to be able to like dive into that world. And not just with metal, but really with everything. Like my dad was always um, showing me a lot of awesome like jazz and funk records. And it was like, ooh, like all these things that I was just drawn to, you know? On the way of becoming an artist mm -hmm. with an own voice, you pick inspiration from a lot of artists. Yes. So what were your choices since you started drumming? Like the real choices? For me, it was a lot, a lot at the same time. Like I mentioned, you know, um, I was always drawn to rock and heavy metal, but I also had a lot of um, influence from like my dad 
showing me a lot of guys. So he would show me, I remember the first drumming DVD that I got was a Dave Weckl DVD. So I would definitely credit him as being one of my top influences growing up. I really got into Buddy Rich, Vinnie Caliuta, uh, all those guys. And at the same time, uh, drummers like Joey Jordison and Tim Young, uh, Nicholas Barker to this day is still one of my favorites. Uh, so guys like that were big influences for me. Yeah, Weckl is still out of this world. The first time standing there and seeing how the, the fluidity and, and the dynamics, you, you really can see it. Right? Yeah. And absolutely incredible. It was breathtaking. I yeah. Was... Something that always drew me to his playing was the fact that he almost didn't, he never really needs a band. Like you could watch him play drums, like a 10, 20 minute drum solo and the way that he makes them sing and how dynamic he is, how much of a flow there is. It's just beautiful. So it's always been very inspiring to me. Maybe there are moments when somebody says to you, yeah, there's this drummer, you should check it out. He's the greatest of them all. Mm -hmm. You look like, yeah, he's good. He's a cool cat, but you are not amazed. But when that Dave Weckl moment hit me, I was frozen like, wow. Yeah. I have never seen anything like that before. Yeah, the, definitely when there's drummers like that where they play and you just like feel it, you know, guys like him and Eric Moore, Tony Royster Jr. and the list could go on and on. There's just those guys that when they play, it's more than just playing. It's like it hits you right in your gut, you know? And that's moments like that where you'll never forget it. play pretty complex rhythms, I would say, and complex stickings with an effortless fluidity, even on extreme speed, without losing that tasty touch. Oh, thank you. So I assume at a certain point in your career, you must have made some choices to get your drumming to this level, right? Yeah. So it was on purpose. It was like, ah, oh, look at me, no. <laughs> what happened today? Yeah. So yeah, tell me about that choices. That's the interesting thing for me. Yeah, absolutely. Well, for me, even when I was really young, I knew I didn't want to just be a metal guy. As much as I love metal, it's you know something that I'm very passionate about. I was always inspired by guys like, I would watch like Derek Roddy, for example. I'd be on YouTube and see a video of him playing with Hate Eternal, and then the next video would be him playing with like a blues band or something. And I always thought that was so cool. So what I did is I would just try to throw myself in similar situations. I would pretty much go, anywhere I could to find places to play that were not metal. So it could be an open blues jam or even like church or wherever, you know, it didn't really matter. I just wanted to always throw myself in situations that were uncomfortable. And I feel like that really helped me grow, you know, cause I would always take something from those worlds and bring it back to metal. Even if it just was me practicing playing slower, you know, there's so much to that that could help in metal. When you mentioned like, taste and flow when it comes to playing. I feel like if you're only always playing fast all the time, it's easy for a lot of the taste to get um, looked over. So uh, I always tried to focus on that. Yeah, same here. I've recorded power metal record uh, three times for a music colleague of mine. I hate the music, <laughs> absolutely hate it. Still, you take something from it, mm -hmm. like learning, okay, I mean, I can play 10 minutes 160 BPM bass drums. It's totally pointless, yeah. but you can do it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so you learn something about your body. And last week I recorded two hip hop tracks. Not really good, still I did it because I love those challenges. Mm -hmm. Like repeat all the time, the same weird groove that is, are you familiar with hip hop drums? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so they program stuff. Mm -hmm. They don't use the hi-hat as like we do, like we rock drummers. Right. For us, the hi-hat is the pulse. It's mm -hmm. always there. Or you have your leading limb. Right. And for them, it's just another voice, like yeah. the kick or the snare. Totally. There you go. You have like these uh, linear grooves all the time. Mm -hmm. And now you have this one maybe complicated pattern. And then you play it for like five minutes or no, three and a half probably for hip-hop track. Uh, and the only fills you do is you subtract something. Yeah. And that totally threw me off. So mm -hmm. how, what's your experience with uh, the drums I just uh, described? Yeah, I've had a lot of the same, you know, it's funny you mentioned that, like um, for me, growing, playing with a, uh, like a cover band, I used to do that for a couple years and it was like 
hours and hours of music that uh, was everything from like 80s, 90s to hip hop to classic rock, everything. And um, yeah, there would be a lot of like fills and hi-hat things that you would think as a rock drummer would work when you're like in your practice room, but then when you're doing it with the band, you're like, wait, this totally doesn't work. And I think you pointing out the hi-hat thing is a perfect example, you know, especially with like hip hop. Like if you go in there with the, the approach of like a rock drummer, like you're gonna try to have that hi-hat push the groove in that way, it's just not gonna work. It's not gonna feel right. And you're especially not gonna be able to like dance to it, which is like, a big, you know, that's such a big thing in hip hop. You're trying to get people to dance. Yeah, I totally feel you there where it's like, you know, your entire approach has to change and you have to really serve the music, you know? And in this scenario, playing what's right for the music is absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm, most viewers of my channel probably know that I don't like those sentences like less is more and playing what's right for the song. So it's, for me, it's too narrowing. It's, yeah. It leaves out so many options you still have. But in that case, overplaying will destroy everything unless you are Eric Moore or somebody like that. And even they kind of sit back a little. Yeah, there's always like a time and a place and it'll be a very, like a very apparent uh, in a live situation if you approach it wrong like that, especially with overplaying, you know, like in other styles outside of just metal, it, the space is so important, you know, and uh, if you're filling in all that space, it's, it's just gonna make everything feel very off. <laughs> ask about a certain technique, but rather about self-reflection mm -hmm. and goals and problems and solutions for those problems and those goals. Mm -hmm. Because I think talking about all those steps is more important than just talk about how a specific motion is being perfected. Yeah, absolutely. So looking back and looking at you now, what different stages in your learning career do you have passed and what valuable epiphanies were along your way? And first of all, you have to realize that you have a problem. So yeah. Definitely. I think for me, a big thing lately has just been relaxing, especially when we're playing these bigger shows. I think when you're uh, you're playing metal, the adrenaline hits and you're just like, you get into like caveman mode, which is like, it's, yeah, it's fun, but at the same time, it's almost like you're like choking the life out of your performance because you're so tense. So what I have been really trying to focus on, even in the extreme situations, is just really relaxing, remembering to breathe, and almost kind of going into like a meditation, like Zen mode up there, rather than just crazy, you know, ah, here we go. So yeah, that's been my big thing over the past couple of years. I'm always telling myself before we get on stage, just take a breath, relax, and you know, just get into a flow. When I watched your arcade drum cam from 2012, not only did you use a cowbell <laughs> and switch to traditional a few times, yeah. but your whole posture and performance is super energetic, like talking about the beast mode. What exactly has made you changing your style during the 10 years? Is it the don't go nuts every time, just lay down the groove? It's not necessarily don't go nuts. I feel like I still go nuts up there, but it's still at the same time a little more controlled. And I think it's a big thing too, is I tour a lot more these days and I'm getting a little older. Like before, like I was like, oh, I'm just like this crazy kid on stage, just going absolutely wild every night. And I was able to recover, you know, like now it's like, I got to kind of think about it a little bit more. Like, okay, I still have a show tomorrow and the next day and the next day. And then they could be a lot of big festivals. So I'm, I'm just trying to sort of pace myself. I still want to give it power and energy and excitement. Um, but, you know, yeah, I want to I want to be able to get through the whole tour and have it be awesome rather than, oh, by the end of the tour, I'm just like falling apart, you know? Do you 
you still switch to traditional from time to time? And why did you do it in the first place when you were blasting your way through those blistering songs? Yeah, well, at that time, I was really, I was doing a lot of jazz when I wasn't doing metal stuff, you know? So it just, it felt more natural. I don't really do that stuff as much these days. I don't really have as much time. And on top of that too, like I have my daughter, my wife. So like when I, before, when I'd go out on tour, I'd get home and the first thought was, okay, where could I go to play even more? You know, and I would always end up at like these open jams. And for me, I would never consider myself like a real jazz drummer. Like if anything, that's the style of music I suck most at. But when I would go to these like open jams just to do like straight ahead jazz stuff, I always would practice traditional, you know, it just it felt natural to me. So I remember at that time with Archaic, you know, here and there, I was like, yeah, I'll switch to traditional just for fun, you know, because that's what I was doing at the time. Um, I don't know if I'll ever do that with Trivium, maybe for fun sometime, but th I don't think there's anything in Trivium that calls for that, you know. I mean, usually it's very fitting for the more dynamic and the more silent parts, mm -hmm. then you really can hear the difference. Other than that, I would say it's, yeah, in blistering metal, it's like weird. <laughs> it is, yeah, it's kind of like, it's not totally necessary, although I have seen a small handful of guys be able to do it. Like, for example, I'm, I don't know if you're familiar with like Nick Pierce. Uh, he used to play in The Faceless and plays in a bunch of other bands now, but he was like a straight up like death metal drummer that was playing traditional and like full on, like he, he had the same blasts as like Derek Roddy or George Colias, but all traditional. And it would just blow my mind, you know, cause you don't, you don't really see that a lot, yeah, but. It's pretty hard to, to pull off, I would yeah. say. Yeah, but I mean, hey, I mean, at the end of the day, I guess if it, if it works for you, then more power to you. You have been drumming for Archaic, Decrepit Birth. You took over Gene Hoagland's chair in Testament, and since a couple of years now, you're the drummer for Trivium. So yeah. those are all very demanding positions, but for different reasons, right? Yes, absolutely. So uh, yeah, can you please elaborate a little more on the different demands? Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's, it's funny you mentioned that, because I think about that sometimes, about how every single position is different, and they all have their own challenges in different ways. Like, for example, Archaic, Decrepit Birth, and like the other project that I did, Brain Drill, they were all pretty much just balls to the wall, as extreme and as fast as you can go, which was fun, you know, like I love that stuff. But then I remember when I started working with Eric Peterson from Testament, the approach was just so different. I thought it was gonna be a lot easier, like, oh, this is, you know, this is thrash, you know, I, I, I do the extreme stuff, this is gonna be a piece of cake, and it was, the total opposite. It challenged me in such a different way because it's like, it's all about the feel of, you know, that old school thrash. And another thing about Eric too is with his guitar parts, like everything that he does, he would want the drums to lock up with. And that's such an important part of Testament, you know, like every everything has to lock. So I wasn't used to that at first, you know, but the thing I loved about it is it taught me how to uh, write that way. And by the time I got into Trivium, I remember when we were in the studio for The Sin and the Sentence, it was like all those little tricks I learned from everything I did before I used with them. So it felt like a, just like a big, uh, big journey, man, of just learning so many different things from different people. I always uh, try to be like a sponge and take every experience and use it, you know? Very good. Yeah, same here. I mean, without being in Testament or any of the <laughs> other bands you just mentioned. So one thing that stood out to me when I was watching the Testament video is the eye contact. Steve DiGiorgio is constantly looking at you. Yeah. But not only to see, is he pulling it off? No, it's a connection. Yeah, totally. And the other guys as well, not yeah. just him. I mean, because he's the rhythm section. Absolutely. Especially in a situation like that, because with the Testament thing, I was working with Eric for a long time, but I was working mostly with Eric like with writing, you know, I would go to his house almost every day and we would uh, just 
write for Brotherhood of the Snake, uh, the videos that you're talking about, that was some of the first times I had performed with Testament. Like none of the other guys would come to practice. It was just me and Eric. So, you know, when you're looking at Steve DiGiorgio, looking at me, that's like maybe our first or second time ever playing together, you know? Like I remember the very first uh, festival I played with Testament was Heavy MTL. And like, I didn't even see Alex uh, Skolnick until he was walking on the stage as the intro is playing. Like we never practiced as like a band, you know? So yeah, it was, it was definitely, uh, it was definitely wild playing with them. But uh, yeah, having that connection on stage where it's like, you know, you get through the first song and then you just start to kind of vibe off of each other. You know, you're just kind of feeling each other's grooves, you know, getting in, getting in the vibe. Yeah, because metal is not really the music where this kind of exchange happens. Yeah. It's more like everybody plays to this maybe click track. And yeah. of course, the other guys are producing the sound, but it could as well be just the backing track and you're in the studio or whatever. Right. And if you have like blues or real feel music, mm -hmm. then it's all about the expression. And the expression is not just the tone you have. Yeah. It's like everything. And Definitely. Yeah, it, it helps so much. I'm playing with the guitar player. We are improvising metal stuff all the time because we know each other since kindergarten. And, oh, uh, cool. So there's a real connection and it's always passing the ball to the other guy and yeah. inspiring and constantly keeping the ball up. That's yeah. the goal, like keeping the ball up on the fountain. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And that's, you know, now that's exactly how it is with Trivium as well. Like, you know, we are, I, I feel like when we play, like we're all one, you know, and it's awesome because like, Paolo, Matt and Corey, they're always coming back to the drum set, just like rocking out, you know? So it, it never really feels like, oh, I'm just up here playing by myself, you know? It's like, they're always coming back, just like, yeah, you know, really vibing with each other. And that's really cool, you know? Like to me, that just makes it so much, so much more fun. It's like, you're all kind of pushing each other, you know? And that's what you want. You want to always constantly be growing. Yeah. Talking about Trivium, so there were some lineup changes at the drum position, which mm -hmm. in my eyes is not really ideal since that is the foundation, right? Right. So with you on board, Trivium are stable now, and I hear and read from all directions that you have brought the band to the next level. Oh, so, that's very flattering. <laughs> yeah. How do you feel? Like, what is the reaction of the other guys about you giving them fire? Oh, that's... Well, first off, yeah, thank you very much. That's very flattering. I'm very grateful to be here. I mean, it's really like a dream come true. And it, I really look at it like it's my privilege to be playing with guys of this level. And they're so amazing to me. Um, really from day one, the first jam we ever had, I, I remember everybody had smiles on their face and you can tell everybody was really excited. And after that first European tour that I did with them, they were like, we want you, <laughs> we want you to stick around, man. You know, this just feels right. Please don't leave. <laughs> yeah, you know, it would just, they pretty much were like, hey, if this, if this is what you want, it's yours. And I said, yeah, you know, and that was, 2017 was the first tour I, I did with them. And uh, ever since then, it's just been amazing. And uh, yeah, I'm just grateful. And I, I love that I'm in a place where I could feel that they're grateful for me too. So it's really, truly a win-win situation. Being a good musician and being a good band member are two different things, very different. Yeah. And over the years, I realized that there are three pillars for a good work relationship. So doing the best you can first, second, being true to your words and reliable, and third thing is be friendly and social. Mm -hmm. And if even one of those pillars isn't up there with the other two, the whole ship is out of balance and will eventually sink. Absolutely. In my opinion. So getting a job because you're good at it, getting along with folks and keep the job since everybody can count on you. Would you agree with that from your own experience? Absolutely. As a matter of fact, that's, uh, that's a big part of uh, what happened with Trivium is like they had already seen me play before. Uh, and I remember the first 
uh, conversation I had with Paolo on the phone, he said, we know you can play, but we wanna see really where your mindset is at. So before we even jammed at all, uh, I remember Paolo, he flew out to San Francisco just to come and talk with me and like kind of have a meeting and see like, okay, where's where's your, your head at? You know, are you looking to just do something like little session work or are you, cause we're looking for the guy. And um, that was a big thing. He was like, we want to make sure that like everyone's on the same page. And uh, that's why after the European tour, the first tour I did with them, then it was like, okay, like you're in, you know, that was kind of like my tryout because you really want to see like if you could live with somebody, you know, like that's a big thing, you know, you're literally living with people. So you want to make sure everyone's, everyone's getting along and there's a good vibe and thankfully there was, but it's very important. I mean, you could be the best player in the world, but if one of those things is off, you know, it's, it's, you can't go that far. No, it doesn't last long. It doesn't last long. Except for the only position where you can do it is when you're the band leader. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> then you can be a prick. <laughs> yeah, if you if you want to be that guy that's just like, oh, you're you're fired, I'm the boss, you know? Like you could do that if you want. <laughs> but yeah, in this situation, we're all we're all just trying to get along and have a good time, you know? For a band, there are three stages that are equally important. You have writing material, you have recording, and then you have presenting it. Mm -hmm. So what is the most fun? For me, man, it's really all of it. I mean, I love writing as much as I love going in the studio to record it, as much as I love performing live. To me, I feel like they're all equally as fun. That's a very short answer. Yeah, Please you elaborate. know, it's, it's, <laughs> it's, for me, it's really that simple. I, I, there's not really one I love more than the other. I think they're all awesome. You get different, a different gratification from each different thing, you know? Do you play differently in those three stages? I would say the only time I play different is in writing because there's gonna be a lot of uh, stop and go, stop and go. We might get to a certain section and then start changing some stuff around. Uh, but once the songs are completely locked in and we know exactly what we're gonna do, I would say not much changes from the studio to live. I'm pretty much gonna try and give it 100%. I think with the studio, my whole goal is to just try to capture that special moment, that lightning in a bottle, you know? And then I try to also bring that to the live situation as well. Yeah, it's preparing the great moment, then having the great moment, mm -hmm. and then recreating the great moment. But Absolutely. probably the, the most important thing should be recording because that's what you're measured on. Yeah, I guess, I guess I, now that you mention it, I would say when it comes to being in the studio, that's when I really, I focus on like this really small things, you know, how hard am I blasting? How, how evenly are all my hits? And I also, in the studio, a big thing for me is like trying to capture the dynamics, you know, from soft to, to loud, you know, and everything in between. Cause I, I want that to be captured. I don't want the producer to have to ever go back into my recording session and go, oh, you weren't playing as hard here or here I have to go and fix this stuff. You know, I want the producer at the end of the day to go, man, I didn't really have to do much of anything with your tracks, you know. Do you like to play electronic drums? Really? I do, especially before our live shows. I mean, it's way better than what we used to do where we just had the practice pad. Uh, this, you could, I mean, I'll spend hours on this thing every day. I actually, uh, I usually come in here like right after dinner and I'll spend a couple hours just jamming along to tracks and just kind of killing time, you know? Yeah, so it's a lot of fun and it, it helps out a lot for the live performance for sure. It's a little different, you know, but it, it's, to me, it's the closest thing to a kit before I actually get up there. So I would say in the first song, it takes me a couple seconds to like adjust and be like, all right, you know, acoustic kit mode. 
But uh, yeah, this thing's great. I really love it. Do you need the warm up, or are you actually one of those guys who just could go out there and play like 220 BPM in oh, the box without? No, I can't do that. I, I, there are I, people who, who can do it. Oh yeah, yeah. I've, I've heard of guys that they just they just walk up there and they just crush. One minute they smoke and, and stand, stand next to you, and the next minute they are. Shouldn't you be on stage? Yeah, yeah, yeah you're right. Like, oh. They're gone and they're pulling it off. Yeah, you're like, wait, is that the same guy that was just standing right here? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would say my warm up has definitely changed a bit since I started playing with this kit. Before it was a lot more uh, structured where I would do, okay, I'm gonna do 10 minutes of hands, 10 minutes of feet of double bass, and then I'm gonna do all these stretches. But now I just come in here and I pretty much just play until showtime and I'll focus a lot on stuff that isn't really metal. I'll focus a lot on groove and all that. And then it really helps me to relax when I'm on stage because I'm just back here. It's more just kind of like practicing at home, you know, where you're just, you're in a relaxed state. So you're just flowing and uh, I like it a lot. By the way, you're a musician, like a pro, and you only play one hour and a few minutes every night. That's not enough. <laughs> You're here for music, right? Yeah. So I totally get it why you want to play a little bit more. Yeah, a lot, a lot of, of getting wasted or getting your head clear from the day from the night before. Yeah, for sure. That's what I that's what I do, man. I just I I utilize all of that time because you know there's so much time throughout the day, you know, and it's like, man, if this thing's just sitting here, yeah, I want to practice. Let me work on my my weaknesses, you know. Let me work on my left hand or my doubles or whatever it is that I feel like I need some work. So it's good, cool. it's cool. What I think all drummers should do more often is play together on the tour. So how is the exchange with the tour drummers? the drummers you're touring with. I would love to do that. My dream scenario would be if every single drummer could have a setup like this, and we, if that were the case, there would be a, a kit there, a kit there, and I, I'd want to just jam for hours, you know, but um, I don't think they're, they're able to do that. The cool thing is like, for example, the other day, the drummer of uh, Malevolence, he came and he just, you know, hung out in the pig pen for a little bit. Pig pen is our, our jam, by the way, for anyone who doesn't know, our jam room. Uh, he just came and hung out and we were just talking drums and trading ideas. He loved my Axis pedals and he was crushing on them, you know? So things like that are always fun. I just love hanging out with other drummers and musicians and just chopping it up, just talking and, you know, seeing their approach and they'll ask little things that I do, so. Yes, yeah, so next time, bring an extra kit. Yeah, we're gonna need a good three or four of them. <laughs> And extra amps, too. <laughs> All right, I got to start warming up, getting ready for our show. Thank you very much, Drum Talk, for having me. I'll see you guys later.